We put you in the middle so you don't get in trouble. <laughs> and now we're here. So we've had these great, um, great presentations. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you so much, Alex, for really setting the stage for what we're going to talk about. Of course, our remarks have focused quite a bit on just disinformation. But one of the key things to understand is that disinformation does not exist in a vacuum. Disinformation is one of the tools that exist in terms of influence operations. And influence operations are what make so that disinformation actually sticks. Disinformation is actually effective. Um, and I think, you know, thinking about, you know, why a news story about someone who is very corrupt in a country where corruption is everywhere sticks is because it matches part of their reality, right? And so I think this discussion, we're really going to focus on unpacking that toolkit, thinking about the different tools that are used to destabilize the political discourse and how that can be effective around elections. Um, I think that the best way to start would probably be to kick it over to Ambassador Dan Freed. If you could give us an overview just generally of, you know, what are influence operations? What do bad actors do? And then we will split it up with our experts to talk deeper dive. It isn't new. In the old days, my days, the Soviet Union started the rumor that the CIA had invented AIDS. And the way it planted the story was to go to um, pliable African newspapers, get the story planted, and then encourage left-wing newspapers in Europe, fringe newspapers, to pick it up. And by degrees, move the story from the geographic fringes of the mainstream media to the political fringes to the political mainstream by degrees. And it worked. The rumor was picked up. It remained folklore for years and years. CIA invented AIDS. This took a number of weeks to months to put into place. And the Soviet propaganda apparatus and the KGB, which, which was running the operation, relied on, in Europe at least, the category of people called useful idiots and fellow travelers, various witting, semi-witting or unwitting agents. Now, of course, thanks to the internet, the process doesn't take weeks, it takes hours, sometimes minutes, and instead of actually relying on human beings to disseminate the story to favorable or well-inclined in, well um, newspapers, you can have sites set up in the thousands, or bots, or various impersonator accounts, flogging your story and moving it into the mainstream very quickly. Ali Philippe, Mr. Ali Philippe was right when he pointed out that the printing press created not only the Gutenberg Bible, but all kind of kinds of religious tracts that helped spark the religious wars. And propaganda using the technologies of the time is as old as the technology of the time. Um, the United States, 1790s, scurrilous pamphlets making all kinds of claims, Adams about Jefferson, Jefferson about Adams. This stuff goes on through the 19th century. The, the cheap daily newspaper, the radio, the television, every advance of technology can be and has been subverted um, for propagandistic purposes. So there is nothing conceptually new about propaganda on the internet except that it's awfully fast and it is awfully hard to fight the way all new technologies are seen as hard to fight, which gets us into the area of solutions, but that's the next topic. My point, though, is that this is not new. We have dealt with this before, and it is useful to take a step back and look at the solutions through which democratic and even non-democratic societies have developed and then applied norms of behavior to integrate new uh, information technology without succumbing to the worst features of that technology. Ambassador Freed, you mentioned useful idiots, fake idiots. 
Um, and I think this is a great opportunity to bring David Aladante, who knows very well about useful idiots and fake idiots um, <laughs> that have, you know, decided to take up uh, <laughs> quite a few stories and, and uh, amplify that which is false. If you could just, yeah. you know, get us started I, on I that. I know a little bit about them. A little. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the thing is that I, I completely agree with you, Ambassador, and, and I think... The problem today is that when you compete online, the ground is leveled and journalists have to compete with people who act like they are journalists, but they are not. So I'm a journalist, I've always been a journalist, and I, I, I believe that what we do is just like, we actually are exercising a right that belongs to the whole of society. You know, society has to be in order to make good choices and make good decisions, we need in information. You vote for this candidate or the other one, you know what to do, you know if you have to protest or not. But this information kills the journalist and tries to bypass um, the press in order to make it easy for politicians or like authoritarian regimes to actually talk to the people directly. So you were talking about these little campaigns that we suffer as journalists, the attacks towards journalists. I've been accused of being an agent of the CIA. Now I'm supposed to work for NATO. I've got money from George Soros. Just because, you know, I've been trying to report on disinformation here in Europe. And the, first in the Catalan crisis, now with the far right parties, uh, with the Italian referendum. And yeah, like we have to suffer a lot of people who actually play the role willingly. How, how did, uh, just to summarize, how do that, did, did they come to the topic of mis disinformation and what a great challenge it's for democracy nowadays? Actually, it was not here in Spain. I was a correspondent in, in the Middle East. I worked for a Spanish newspaper there. And when I had the chance to go to Syria, I had the chance to see how Russian public media portrayed the conflict and portrayed the United States and portrayed NATO. The United States was going to start a war in Syria just because they wanted some type of gas or oil or something. NATO was corrupt and was trying to like, find ways. This is all like portrayed there. Chemical attacks didn't exist. The regime, supported by Russia, was actually defending democracy against all odds. And, you know, this type of little bubble that was created there was later like slowly expanded into other areas of attack. Now we face uh, an environment in which, you know, the Russian public media operate in Spanish, in French, in, Ara in Arabic, it's a major problem, in Chinese, in any language that you may imagine. And they are portraying an alternative and different reality. That's what they claim, like we portray a different reality. And to actually address your point, when they come here, they find people who are willing and ready to believe what they are portraying. We've all, like, I'm sure you've, you've heard about it even if you live in, in the United States. There were 1,000 people injured in the referendum in Catalonia. We've seen those images right now. Were there 1,000 people injured? They were not. You know, like this was in the front pages of many, many newspapers. There were a lot of people who were willing and ready to believe this because there were people here who were actually saying this. And then like, <coughs> the problem is like when you don't have a strong media who actually takes on the challenge of verifying facts, mm -hmm and you know doing our job like then like i think everything fails and you have this current dystopian situation in which you know anything is possible in europe far right far left and the middle of the ground is lost so much to unpack there particularly thinking about journalists verifying facts in an era where everything is about being first, being the breaking news, being viral. That is what the business model is designed for. Um, but uh, before I like deep dive into that, I want to talk a little bit more, you know, Nico, Nico, we know each other for, for quite a bit. Uh, you contributed to the Kremlin's Trojan Horses report series for the Atlantic Council at a time where folks were not paying attention to the challenge of Kremlin, and particularly as it targeted Spain. Um, you're an expert on hybrid warfare. If we talk about, you know, we've been talking about how the far right and far left are starting to communicate beyond just their, their own communities and their own networks in their countries. Help us unpack a little bit about how dark money and disinformation and political networks across 
domestic actors actually, you know, is operating right now and the threat behind that. Okay. Um, it's also a solve. difficult question. Yeah, yeah, yeah solve the problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's such a question. Um, well, the point is that um, uh, for those of us who were following Russia since many years ago, uh, it was more easy probably to see this coming. Um, because in several years ago, um, it was clear that they made a decision that they need to um, undermine the West and uh, undermine us in order to protect themselves. Uh, this is always in a problem of uh, wrong perception in the Kremlin, um, but, 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 but which is real. I mean, they really think that there is a plan from the West mm -hmm. to destroy Russia, actually. So that's why they, all, uh, why they interpret all their moves as a defensive moves. They always think that they are defending themselves uh, in Ukraine, uh, in Syria, whatever. They always think that, and everything is part of a plan. That's, that's, that's their perception. Eh? So if David is publishing whatever news, then it's part of a plan because either Soros or the CIA or, or whatever, it's behind that, that, that thing. And what uh, the Kremlin is doing is basically to offer a platform to multiply this effect of our own crisis. Because here we have three, I would say, three dimensions. Uh, one is that uh, the one that has been uh, referred by um, Minister Palacio, uh, this deeper crisis of the West, of our liberal democracies, which is not exactly coming from 2008, but definitely since then, uh, we are still struggling with this and the lack of prosperity or the apparent lack of prosperity and the crisis of legitimacy of our systems. Then we have uh, related to this, the crisis of the traditional media. Uh, the, the, the business model is not clear. Uh, this is what David was referring to. Um, and also this is connected to digitalization of the world. So all this combined, uh, this is a, a pretty serious challenge. And uh, it's not only Russia uh, doing this, of course. Um, private actors, state actors, and many others, and, and the media standards are not necessarily the best everywhere. Uh, I'm coming from, from Barcelona, um, and we have some local channels which are not that different from, from Russia today, I have to say. Um, and, and sorry, now for a moment I'm lost, but um, I also enjoy this uh, analogy with the war on drugs, yeah? So we have uh, this problem, this will be, yeah. So this will be connected to the demand, yeah? Mm -hmm. This wide crisis that we have to approach related to uh, education, eh, media literacy, all these kind of pro um, approaches that are part of the solution. But then we have the suppliers, eh? and, and I know a bit about this, one of the main suppliers, eh? Ambassador Fried was referring, as Russia has been doing this for a long, long time, and they identify rightly that the, 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 the question of the legitimacy of the West, which is now uh, under, under pressure, is, a, is an element to exploit. But because what they are doing is to exploit vulnerabilities, and we have many vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. um, and the problem is that we have to decide uh, whether we approach all this all together at the same time, which is going to be difficult, because we cannot solve all these vulnerabilities from one day to another, or if we focus on at least to prevent these hostile foreign actors to take advantage of this situation. But this is easily said and it's difficult to, to, to tackle because they are basically taking advantage of our free flow of information and freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. And how to apply legislation uh, to deal with this uh, problem is particularly difficult. At least something that needs to be done and, uh, and that's what me and others are trying to do, uh, which is not really easy, is to connect all dots. Because as you have said in the beginning, uh, this information is not taking place within a vacuum. And when we refer to the Kremlin, this is part of a big framework. And that connects from uh, nuclear intimidation, military means, to the use of dirty money, to disinformation, and to many other intelligence services, of course, and to many other things. It doesn't mean that there is a clear detailed plan in place. Mm -hmm. But there is clearly a strategic or uh, uh, coherent strategy behind all these moves. So we can connect all these dots. And of course, um, you can advance your strategic um, goals funding specific political parties within Europe. So probably we need to adapt our legislations to this uh, problem. Uh, so far we know about the Front National, which is now called Regroupement National, if I'm correct. Um, since a few days back, we heard about the Lega in Italy. Mm -hmm. 
and these are probably just the uh, type of the tip of the of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. So there is much more there, and we can see also a pattern also um, in the kind of factors they are approaching in far right and far left. And, and, and I finish with this. Um, uh, Alexander was referring to to the yellow vest. It's quite interesting. The positive coverage that all almost all Russian media, not only those owned by the state directly, are giving to the yellow vest as the the representatives of the genuine French people uh, <laughs> against the elite globalist, um, uh, this kind of hidden government or, or whatever. So this is what they are offering. They think they are defending themselves, but undermining us. Yeah. I mean, I think when we talk about vulnerabilities, right, I think we ought to make sure that we do separate levels. We have our societal vulnerabilities, and then we have the vulnerabilities to our critical infrastructure, which is where I really want to talk to Kadri uh, and really bring her in into this. Um, a lot of the political discourse, or when we think about democratic um, institutions, when we think about um, voting, when we think about elections, we think about protecting our ballot system and cyber. But the truth is that there's different elements within cyber that can easily disrupt and affect the way that we see, you know, candidates, the way that we see um, our, even our own uh, environment, right? There's the, the narrative that the Kremlin pushes a lot is the decay of the West, right? Like, you know, you can't walk out, like if you go to, to Copenhagen, um, they, they, they will take your kids kind of uh, narrative, right? And so it would be great if you could just like, unpack a little bit on the critical infrastructure, the vulnerabilities, um, and, and how we can start thinking about that. No easy task. I, I, I have no easy questions. <laughs> uh, it's funny. Uh, I normally get those questions from the other uh, point or from the other perspective in particular. So uh, describe me, to me how is not, this not a technical issue? Mm -hmm. And you come from, a, from a, the, exactly the opposite angle. And uh, because I've had, and we, and uh, not least in Estonia, we've had to preach quite a bit that election security is not... Uh, simply about securing the uh, the sort of the the information systems or vote tallying and vote, voting systems, but it's about uh, securing our in increasingly digital societies, and uh, and we are very often fixated on the on the sort of the technical issues. We are in in general, uh, I mean, uh, we are we are rather good at understanding elections in the context of overall uh, constitutional and political processes of a country, but as soon as we be began discussing elections, cyber security, uh, people become uh, very quickly somehow myopic around the around the issue, uh, around technology, around techno technological or technical issues. So uh, I think we need to zoom out from there again. Uh, for one, the issue is not primarily about uh, elections as such. Mm -hmm. It is about the resi resilience of our uh, digital ecosystems and, and, uh, and very much about the resilience of our normal habitual functioning of societies. Uh, so elections are simply an element in that. Uh, not unique, not different, it, uh, just special because of their constitutional and political significance. And uh, in terms of threat picture or cyber threat picture, what we've seen over the past five years, I would say now, is that uh, disinformation and attacks against election processes exploit and are amplified uh, by our inherent weaknesses, even, even in that domain. Our dividing issues and value conflicts, and, and they are aggravated by the means we tend to use the, uh, to solve problems. Uh, oftentimes by exposure and confrontation and competition. So there is let, little inherent drive towards uh, cooperation. And, and that also means that we are all pretty comfortable in operating within the walls of our silos, even, even in the sort of the, the technological or, mm -hmm. or cyber security mm -hmm. sense. And we often lack the practical ap appreciation for the level of connectedness we all mm -hmm. uh, have with everyone else. So, um, so these, yeah, what, what I guess I would like to say is that these patterns tend to concentrate around elections because of their significance, because of their concrete rallying point in time. But uh, I think we should not view and work to address them as uh, attacks against elections, but rather as attacks against the society's way of life and our values and our coherence. And that in turn implies that 
uh, election cybersecurity must be uh, planned as an, and, uh, and executed as an integrated whole, uh, with, together with defending the, the overall digital ecosystem. So in addition to the securing the ballots and tallying systems, uh, comprehensive elections risk management also means that we consider the risks in auxiliary systems that uh, might impact elections. So uh, what are the critical dependencies on other digital systems? And where do the threats lie against our critical infrastructure? So communication services, uh, uh, electricity supply, digital identity used for uh, not just voting, as we do in Estonia, but also vote, uh, vote tallying, for example. And how could a continuity or integrity incident uh, in these systems, in these auxiliary systems, uh, impact the process and the perceived legitimacy of the elections process? And how are the risks managed, and uh, these risks in particular, the, and who's responsible for that? So, on the one hand, critical infrastructure cybersecurity is vital for assuring the security of the elections process. Uh, but it's also in, important because it gives assurance of the reliability of the uh, digital environment and c that conditions the normalcy for us as a, as a society. Also during the campaign period, not mm -hmm. just the sort of the voting days. So. Uh, in the EU, EU, we have the, the NIS directive, the Network and Information Secur System mm -hmm. Security Directive, and it's, uh, uh, it's enforced its last, last uh, May, and uh, I would say it's quite a significant achievement, a rather strong tool in two regards. First, it creates a consistent understanding across EU what, we, uh, what functions and services we consider as essential for our societies. But it also creates a mandatory and regular risk assessment and management mechanism so that we ideally can be adequately aware of uh, our digital reliance of the vulnerabilities as well as threats to our most critical functions. Uh, but uh, in that vein, I, I believe uh, we shouldn't be dogmatic uh, about the NIS or the mandatory mechanisms. Uh, especially in the context of uh, democratic processes, uh, uh, critical infrastructure is not black and white. There are varied la layers of practicality, for example, due to cross-sector dependencies mm -hmm. or cross-service dependencies. And uh, for another, there are uh, services and infrastructures going beyond uh, uh, formally designated critical infrastructure that can significantly affect public uh, functions and public trust. So think media, for example, even social media, or think political parties and the NGOs. They may not be subject to specific cybersecurity obligations, but uh, extending assistance to them often means a significant leap in, their, uh, in bringing them up to speed, in understanding and ma managing not just their cyber risks, but by proxy also building societal resilience to, uh, to cyber threats. And yes, of course, this does re uh, require resources as well. And then if I may, I've taken up quite a bit of time, but, uh, but I think one layer that, uh, that cannot be ignored in, uh, in this picture is the, uh, if we think about the ecosystem-wide cyber risk management, it also has to do with a, a digital literacy of uh, political parties and the candidates and the uh, electorate. And I uh, am fairly keen to stress this is not about uh, just about cyber hygiene, uh, but more fu fundamentally an, an issue of literacy, because cyber hygiene practices or following them, it may amount to, well, about uh, four-fifths of uh, cybersecurity. But uh, cyber hygiene rules will not stick if uh, their purpose and nature, uh, the, the why and how things work, are not understood at the fundamental level. And that's uh, something we need to work on when we talk about cyber security of the, of the society and the, uh, at large and the elections in particular as well. Wonderful. Thank you, Kadri. I do I want to, you know, stay on this. Um, 
topic on, on the vulnerability side, right? Because we've talked about how often malicious actors use the very same freedoms that we have and that we enjoy in order to exploit and divide us. Um, you know, we t we've talked about how the Kremlin sees any, any move from the West as an attack on them and, and, you know, kind of mobilizes all of the tools that they have to, to counter. So I, I wanted to talk a little bit about, okay, so if we're thinking about they're exploiting our freedom of expression and our freedom of speech. Um, they're they're getting in there. Our solution, uh, presumably, it's you know to also um, <sighs> how to explain this in a way that makes sense. If our democracy fails, authoritarians succeed, right? If we if freedom of expression is what's being exploited, and our response is to limit freedom of expression. To, to really ex exhaust that, right, to, to uh, react on that, then authoritarian regimes succeed. So when we're talking about solutions, can we think a, a bit through what, what are some democratic things that we can employ now to address some of the challenges that we've addressed in this session? Ambassador well, <clears throat> I think I'll start with two basic principles. In attacking any public policy problem, first, Unpack the problem. Don't look at the problem as a whole, because all problems <clears throat> looked at in the aggregate appear to be impossible. And you'll run screaming from the room because it all looks, it all looks hopeless. If, you regard, if we start looking at the disinformation challenge as, an, as a challenge of um, the existential nature of truth, we're going to go down a rabbit hole and never be able to solve it. So unpack the problem into smaller digestible bits. Secondly, second principle, work within our democratic norms. Don't become them in order to fight them. The United States learned that lesson the hard way during the Cold War. Our biggest screw ups as the United States of America came from ignoring our own best principles and starting to imitate the enemy in tactics. Bad idea doesn't work. When we were true to our own principles, we succeeded the most. All right, basic stuff. What is, how does that apply to the issue of, how do those two applies? Unpack the problem, stay true to your principles, apply to the challenges of disinformation. First, separate domestic and foreign. The Russians exploit our divisions within our societies and of course, so do domestic actors. But our field of, manu of maneuver and public policy solutions are more applicable to foreign actors. Okay? There, there are things we can and should do to limit foreign penetration of uh, foreign occult, hidden penetration of digital space um, than we should apply to our own domestic actors. What do I mean by that? Content controls really don't have much of a place, in my opinion, fighting disinformation. I know that in fighting, that there are controls against pornography or against um, ISIS beheading videos. I understand that, but that is not terribly applicable against, say, Russian disinformation ops. If you go down the road of content controls, you force a government agency to be the arbiters of truth. I don't know about yeah, Spain, but I would not like, and it is not in the American tr tradition, to trust any administration in the United States with the role of being the arbiter of truth. Don't go there. So use principles of transparency <clears throat> and integrity to filter out foreign disinformation. By transparency and integrity, I mean forcing, for example, disclosure of foreign bots disguised as human beings. Use technical means to expose deep fakes, you know, fake people, like the one Alexander created for us. Um, that probably is in the realm of technology, if imperfect. Um, if, if Juan from Madrid or Barcelona is not actually one, 
And he isn't actually from Barcelona. He's Ivan from the St. Petersburg troll farm that the Kremlin funds. People ought to know that. There ought to be a ban on impersonator accounts. And frankly, that is well within the technical, technical capability of most social media companies even today. Algorithmic bias is another area that we ought to look at. Algorithmic bias um, drives sensational and extremist coverage because it pays. Alexander talked about this earlier. It, extremist coverage is what we go for when our emotional brain kicks in at the expense of our rational brain. Well, in the United States, in, te in the television era, there was a so-called fairness doctrine that the major national television networks had to approximate covering both sides of the issue. Does that precedent allow us, the us being the United States and the European Union, to impose a or require a fairness doctrine for social media companies' algorithms? Now, I don't have an answer to this, but it is at least worthy of exploring whether or not we can limit the deliberate polarization as part of the social media company business model exploited by the Russians and the Chinese through regulation. Now, there are also seemingly boring technical fixes like standard terms of service among social media companies. That mm -hmm. sounds boring in fine print mm -hmm. technical, but it isn't. Because until there is a common definition of a bot yeah. or a, a standard of inauthentic accounts, social media companies can simply not work together. Yeah. When there is a common standard, they may be forced under common regulation to pull certain bots or certain impersonator accounts uh, that meet a certain definition from the internet. Now, I'm, I've deliberately gone small bore and technical because my point is the technical solutions actually exist. That we need, we, the European Union, Europe and the United States need to get beyond the existential dread in the face of this crisis and start focusing on the solutions. And I will admit immediately that no set of solutions will solve the disinformation problem, period. But it may limit it. Which is where I go to Anna Palat, and I'm going to wind, finish up with mm -hmm. Anna Palatio's point. You have supply, you have demand. Mm -hmm. You whack at supply, hoping to get some control over it. You will never reduce it to zero, but you may reduce it significantly. The demand side is, of course, the increase of media literacy and social media literacy, and I refuse to believe that human beings are now much stupider than we were in the 19th century. We may not be smarter, but we are, we are probably not actually stupider. We did learn to discriminate among daily newspapers. Quality journalists, yellow journalists. It took a generation. We managed it. We can do so again. Our policy problem is to control the supply as much as possible while managing to increase the discrimination of demand. And since I spent my whole career in public policy, I'm real good with imperfect solutions because those are the only kind <laughs> you ever get, okay? Except during political campaigns when politicians promise to solve everything. In the real world, partial solutions are Parcel solutions that are good enough is as good as it gets, and that actually probably is enough. Anyway, more on that, but I, I, the United States has spent the last two years admiring the problem and pulling its hair out about the problem enough. We have the tools to solve it, and by the way, a shout out to the European Commission. They have at least taken a stab at solving it through um, the the code of practice, the action plan, the rapid response mechanism that's being put in place before the elections. Critics say it's full of holes, it's weak, it's soft, but the Europeans are doing something about it and I want to give them full credit. We, the United States, ought to be working with them and up our game. Thank you, Ambassador for you. Yeah. David, you're ready. Yeah, uh, Ambassador, like, I cannot imagine 
how a company that knows what I want before I know it and shows the advertisement in my screen and in my phone doesn't have the technical solution to actually tackle some bots. So I exactly. completely agree with you, you know, like <laughs> what works in the advertisement field should work also in the ethics field. But when, when we talk about the Ministry of the Truth, and I have to disagree a little bit, Ambassador, I do not think that the European Commission has done enough. I think they could have done more. They rely on, you know, educational programs and self-regulation. Yeah, go ask RT and Sputnik to self-regulate and you'll see what happens. You know, th they rely on some measures that I think are not enough. Um, if we do nothing, I mean, if we do nothing because we think we're going to run the risk of being a ministry of truth policy-wise, then, like, of course, I have some examples here that I noted down, like, fast, like, we will believe that that famous flight that dropped in Ukraine was shot down because, you know, like the people who were going to cure AIDS were flying there and some pharmaceutical company shut it down <laughs> as opposed to a Russian missile, you know, mm -hmm. and that's what the Russian media are reporting. We would believe that the responsible people for like poisoning uh, Skripal would be Donald Trump and Theresa May, or maybe a Spanish company that had interest in like <laughs> spreading some type of virus, or maybe it was an overdose. This has been published. Mm -hmm. We would think that the war in Afghanistan is started because the United States was looking for some type of gas or like some mineral that was like there, like that never materialized. This is published today by the Russian media. We would believe that George Soros is behind absolutely anything that happens in the world, from like far left to far right to independence to nationalist sentiment. So something needs to be done. And as a journalist, I refuse to believe that propaganda agents have to be treated as I have to be treated. You know, I go through some check, check, checks uh, before I enter any press conference, you know, I have to take exams to enter like uh, the, my studies. You know, I had to like do research. I, I, I'm held to some standards and they are not. Whenever I make a mistake, I have to write a correction. They don't. Um, they are mm -hmm. offered these platforms in order to spread this misinformation uh, and they are not held accountable as we are. I've seen headlines by RT and Sputnik in election uh, time changing. And nobody said anything, tanks in the streets of Barcelona. And they're like, oh, someone said that he saw a tank. Uh, 1,000 people injured. Well, actually, like, it was not injured. Like, they were just treated. Like, this happens every day. I've seen some things that actually work. And one of them has been done in the United States. When you force these people to register as foreign agents, they actually suffer a lot. And they make a lot of noise. They make a lot of noise. And when you see YouTube, and it says like RT is a company that is funded by the Russian government. They make a lot of noise there. I remember to, to I mean, we're talking about the election coverage. Mm -hmm. There are two experiences that I think were very enlightening recently. One, um, in the elections in France, I don't know if you remember, there's a gag, you know, like today, I think it's 48 hours in France where you cannot publish interviews, polls, whatever. This happens in Europe for reasons that escape me nowadays because, you know, like you can actually bypass this through social media. But do you guys remember AM leaks, Emmanuel Macron leaks during the gag time? Like they accused <laughs> uh, Macron of doing drugs, having a lover, like one million things. And they were all fake, but they were there and the media could not do anything. Then Macron, what did Macron do? These guys are not coming in my press, into my press conferences because they are not journalists. And he said that next to Putin. And he said, like, when they behave like journalists, they can come. The second thing that I think works in election time is what Theresa May did during the Skripal uh, poisoning crisis. You know, as she was receiving the information, she created a, a crisis, uh, like a, a war room, and they were releasing the information in real time as they were getting it. So you saw the photos of these people. You saw when they came from St. Petersburg, who they were, what ho hotel they stayed in, what their names were, what their passport were, was. And, you know, the, the media and the people were getting the information to counter 
I mean, I counted 20 different versions from Russian media on who poisoned Skripal, from like overdose yep. to he was not poisoned, he didn't exist. His so, mother-in-law. Yeah, his yeah. mother-in-law. His mother-in-law, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and, and to, just to summarize, like, I think there is something that is really good for fighting this information. And you may agree with him or not, you may be for Trump or against Trump, but the Mueller report on the Internet Research Agency is a dam damning indictment on what Russia has been doing for the past year. And devoting the resources to actually analyze this, research this, and actually see it, you know, um, I think that has done for the fight against disinformation more than anything that the European Commission has done. But I'm European and I have to criticize the European Union. It's like something that we do here. <laughs> <laughs> that you can do here. It's wonderful. I do want to open it up to the audience. I will ask Alex to take my seat. I'm going to move up. If I can get an extra microphone up here, just so that you get all of the fun. And just raise your hand if you have a question. And we have wonderful folks here with mics. And don't be scared. And we'll take them in Spanish, too. All of the options. Perfect. No questions? Did we solve the problem? OK, I have a question here. Question here, I got it. Oh, and please make them questions. Yeah. <laughs> well, first, thank you for the confidence. I have uh, two quick questions. Uh, one for Mr. Arandete. Do you think? Uh, <laughs> do you think is? Do you think is, for example, the problem with the fake news? One thing will help if, for example, every media has to uh, make online, make open all the funding they receive, including the funding advertising they receive for companies of private companies. Um, for the Mr. Ambassador. I have a question, for example, in your country, do you have to resist it to vote? Do you think we can solve also the problem of some people, uh, the influence on the people voting for making also a quick test for being able to vote? But because now we have to have tests for driving, for ha to work in a lot of, with a lot of machines, have a lot of certifications, but nobody talks about a test, a test an exam to be able to vote. That's a great historical question. <laughs> uh, so we have one on transparency, yeah. and we have one on taking a test before you vote. <laughs> and <laughs> go ahead. Okay. Um, so actually, I think this type of criticism of like these dark interests behind every media company, you know, like advertisement, that serves the purpose of this information. Because I mean, I don't need to know who funds RT Sputnik, Hispan TV or other uh, disinformation uh, endeavors because it's so obvious and so transparent. When it comes to media, you know, like the Washington Post has one owner. New York Times has many owners, CNN, the same. But they actually comply with standards. And that's what doesn't happen in the other end of the spectrum. You know, like when CNN makes a mistake, when the Washington Post makes a mistake, I see corrections, letters to the editor, ombudsman or ombudswoman. These other outlets don't do that, you know? Like, I've told you, 20 different versions on how Skripal was poisoned. 20 different versions on, like, the Ukrainian uh, war. So when you actually comply with this, why? Like, you know, like, there are public and private media. If you actually comply, I, I don't think you should be, you know, like, held accountable to some type of like investigation on like dark money and dark interests being behind every newspaper because that's the, 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 the end of journalism. Nico, do you want to add anything on the dark money piece of that? Well, yes. I will emphasize what David was saying about this transparency. Transparency is fine, but I have been uh, the last 15 years working at the think tank sector. Uh, and uh, there are always this um, uh, understanding that uh, there is a clear connection and, and w well established between who's giving the funds and what think tanks or the media are producing. And I, I, I challenge this, this idea. So there is no this direct connection. Actually, in, in, my, in my career, which is not that long, but in these last 15 years, um, the all, in the only occasion in which I have faced problems related to someone manipulating uh, my text, 
has been uh, when I published it with this Russia Beyond the Headlines in 2010 or 11. Well, it's to call them. And, um, <laughs> that they basically, they, they change uh, the title of when uh, they ask me for a piece. So I write the piece, I wrote the piece, and they changed the, the, the title and was completely misleading. Uh, then they, they ch and normally people read the, the, the title and maybe two or three uh, highlighted sentences, but not the whole article. This happened to, to them. And in the other occasion was when I received um, the, the, some correspondent of one Russian media um, asked me some few questions and then um, she was unhappy with the answers and she told me, oh, look, this is too critical to the Kremlin. I cannot publish this, so you, can you change your, your, your answer? And I said, I'm sorry, no, I'm not, I'm not changing the, the, the answers. And she said, look, then we will not publish this. I said, fine, that's, that's, that's up to you. It's not my, my business. But it never happened to me anywhere else. Uh, and I have published it in almost all Spanish newspapers and in the Spanish main think tanks. And I ever never faced this problem of someone telling me what I can say or not. Uh, so, But yeah, there's the money, sorry. And I, uh, one quick point. Mm -hmm. And related to this uh, media transparency, this is getting more sophisticated. Now what we are seeing is Russia Today or Sputnik are the big two um, aircraft carriers, yeah? And then they have uh, subordinate media or connected media. And it's not that clear the, the, the financial connection, but there is an organic connection of the people working at RT. And then all of a sudden, bloop, they have a startup media starting in, in Germany. And all these people are coming from, from there. It is unclear where the money is coming from, mm -hmm. but all of a sudden you have young people normally mm -hmm. with very sophisticated and very professional equipment, etc., traveling to some uh, interesting places. And they are reporting very much in the line of uh, Russia Today or, or Sputnik or well, basically on the line of the Kremlin. But it's unclear, this connection. So this is a serious problem. And the second one, of course, is that the West is vulnerable to money, and this is a problem affecting everyone. And money coming from authoritarian regimes, channeled through uh, to, to think tanks, or that, of course, is, is, is a problem. Dirty money in London, uh, London Grad is a serious problem, and it's very difficult to tackle. So the, the British have a clear understanding that this is a problem. Um, but how to tackle it is very difficult. And of course, there are significant interests around that. Um, what we are seeing also from, from my institute in our research is how many law firms they are hiring. And then <laughs> this is a part of the work for uh, uh, Endavior. Eh? Mm -hmm. So you hire the best or very good professional law firms, and then you can start playing and annoying others in, in their country. So it's, it's, it's really challenging. So I don't have answers, good answers. <laughs> so well, that's really bad. I Sorry. told them we were going to solve this today. <laughs> uh, Ambassador Freed, let's talk about transparency. Uh, well, sorry, talk about voting and whether or not a test on voting. Well, tests on voting have a long and bad history in the United States mm -hmm. because they were used essentially to disenfranchise African Americans starting after the end of Reconstruction following our Civil War. For that reason, there is an allergy in our system against any such tests. And there is, a now, there is now a domestic debate in the United States about how much identification voters should be required to submit in order to vote. And that debate is colored by our bad history. So I doubt that we're going to go very far down that line. And, and there is um, evidence that there is still bias in some of the demands for documentation for individual voters. So not, you will have a fierce debate in the United States. In fact, there is a fierce debate about some of these issues right now, but it's colored by our history. With respect to transparency, I think the issue of trans, I, I think the issue of um, sites that are actually controlled by RT or Sputnik um, in a hidden way ought to be um, the focus of transparency requirements. I think regulation to make, um, to force disclosure of the actual identity of the ultimate funders of a site ought to be part of a normal 
um, digital and maybe ordinary media climate. So I think transparency rather than content controls. Look, I don't disagree with the thing you said about RT, and you're absolutely right. I think it, it, the, the alternative Russian explanations for Skripal peaked at about 22 or 23, mm -hmm. right? But rather than ban RT, I think labeling them as we have as a foreign agent or doing what Macron did mm -hmm. um, is the way to go. They, ought, they can be anathematized without being banned. There can simply be, they can have a kind of mental red line around them the way Pravda did during the Cold War. It didn't happen at once, but it happened eventually. And I think um, Alexander Ali Philippe has told the story of how the exposure in France of the Russian hack of the Macron campaign turned into a bigger story than the actual hack, which brings me to a, another point Transparency is not going to be simply derived by regulation. It will also be uncovered by active and even aggressive civil society. Private groups will be able to expose Russian and other disinformation campaigns. Um, EU disinfo labs is private. East Strat come from the EU ought to be supported. And in, in case you think I'm naive, I don't think the, um, the commissions um, uh, voluntary code of practice is the end. I think it's a decent beginning. You can look at the holes, and you're probably right to point out the weaknesses, but I'm lucky. I, I, I feel myself lucky that anybody is doing anything. Maybe it's a question of expectations. <laughs> anyway, that's another discussion. Uh, we're going to keep taking questions, but I want to make sure that we don't forget the demand side. Right, because we were talking, you know, there are studies that say if you label something and it says it's false, we're five times more likely to click on it because we want to find out what the false new is, right? Or if it's sensational, you're curious, so you click on it. That's what drives, um, you know, some of these things. So, you know, we can we can implement some solutions, but still think about everything else that we have around it. So we have a question here, and got your third. And I think I'll take a couple of questions. So there's uh, one back here. Oh, okay, go ahead. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for the panel. Um, this information is obviously a, a, a very big problem. Um, but what I'm saying is, is more of a, rem somewhere between a remark and a, and a question. Questions only. Uh, it's, it's a question. Okay. I end with a question. Okay, I will, I will stop you. <laughs> okay. Um, I've got the feeling that it, 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 it might have sometimes been a bit um, one-sided. We talked about Russia, the USSR, Putin. Um, I think almost everyone uh, mentioned them at some point. Um, which led me to conclude that perhaps it's more about hybrid warfare than about disinformation. Um, mm -hmm. Because obviously, while a problem, um, you'll never hear me say that, that Putin or that Russian disinformation isn't a problem. I think we can all agree. Uh, that it is, you only need to look at um, our elections. As I think you said, um, the Trump report, or the Mueller report and the congressional reports in the US um, show it. But no one mentioned um, Trump. I don't want to make this into a political discussion at all. Um, I think we would do well to avoid it. Um, but it's pretty clear that he disinforms on a consistent basis as well. Um, spreads lies that are easily verifiable. And so my question to you, and you don't have to stop me, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> is how do you see us regulating ourselves? Um, I don't know if it's an expression in English, I know it is in Dutch. Um, how do you see looking in our own bosom about addressing this problem rather than only focusing on the uh, foreign aspect? I have a, something to say. Uh, I, I work as a journalist now in Washington, D.C., and whenever the President of the United States or anybody in the United States, Capitol, State Department, tell a lie, I can write about it and I can fact check it. That doesn't happen in Russia, period. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen in Venezuela right now. It doesn't happen in Iran. And I think like a political statement is different from this information. The President may tell lies, may like, you know, like manipulate the facts, then we can fact check it. Like as the Washington Post is like, and other newspapers are experiencing the, the Trump bump, 
you know, like a lot of people are reading them, a lot of people are going there. But it's, I think it's fairly different, you know, and yes, hybrid warfare, you, you may correct me, um, uh, Kadri, but, you know, like there's a full, like, Russian doctrine about it, right, like from 2013, so, but I think there's a difference there. Sorry. No, I'm, go ahead, Alex. Yeah. Um, uh, I think it's a very good question. Um, thank you. I think um, right now the question we have to um, ask ourselves is how we as civil society, and when I say we, it's everyone here in the, in the room, um, individually and collectively we can, we can deal with this. I, I invented this this afternoon, so I'm testing it with you. It's like the five fingers of the hand, you know? The democratic civil society has made for uh, NGOs, public powers, um, academics, journalists, and companies, basically the five main pillars. And these pillars can work together or not, but at least they, they are independent. If we, if we shut down everything, we don't, we don't have a hand, we have a fist, and a fist is made to fight. I don't think we want to fight with each other. So I think we need to be sure that in the way we're acting together, we are keeping this discussion alive and we are keeping checks and balances between everyone. Because if we don't do this, we'll not be able to be resilient enough, as Ambassador Fried said, we need to be resilient together inside societies because we might face threats from outside, and I don't name any, any, any powers because everyone can play on this, from China to Iran to Venezuela to US to anyone. For internal political powers, you have now movements that are ready to lie and to cheat to win at the expense of democracy, and that's also a big issue. So we just need to be sure that these five pillars are well together. And that's the most difficult part for us. We need to be sure that we can trust each other. Because if we don't have this, we don't have trust. And then we are just manipulated by emotion again. Mm -hmm. Kadri, do you have anything to add on this in terms of the resilience piece? Yeah, I was thinking the, the, the issue of disinformation versus hybrid warfare. Uh, isn't the hybrid warfare rather a fig leaf of a type to justify uh, interference into our de democratic processes and systems mm -hmm. rather than a, than a genuine reason? <coughs> because uh, uh, I'm rather glad to see that the, sorry, whatever, <laughs> that the, the West hasn't uh, been overly keen to buy the the sort of the, the concept of uh, hybrid warfare. We uh, we are pretty certain in our in the, in the rules of the game. Uh, we know what international law considers as as conflict and the rules that apply in in conflict and in, in peacetime. And, uh, and we are we have stick uh, stuck to our our values in that regard and not get, gotten carried away too much over the, of the, the, whatever way Russia is labeling it. Wonderful. Thank you, Kadri. I have a question all the way in the back and then I'll move. I had you first and then you third and fourth. Don't worry, I'm keeping track. Si, no hay problema. Si puedes esperar un momentito a lo que te cambian el micrófono. A reminder that you can use hashtag disinfoweek to follow the discussion. Esto es desinformación. Bueno. <laughs> La inteligencia está hasta en los micrófonos. Sí. Eh, yo creo que es muy bueno que ustedes están aquí para preparar las próximas elecciones en España, porque eh, lo que resulte de ellas que pueda haber algún fraude electoral, ya estamos viendo algunas conexiones de posibles eh, connivencia con algunos países que no quiero nombrar y que están eh, en, en los periódicos actualmente. Eh, me gustaría, eh, porque lo que está detrás es dos visiones del mundo, una visión más eh, atlántica y otra visión quizá eh, de Rusia con otros países y ahora que estamos 
en el Consejo eh, Atlántico que lo, que lo patrocina. Rusia muchas veces ha dicho que quiere una nueva arquitectura de seguridad. Esto lo ha dicho en diferentes ocasiones. ¿Cómo nos podemos ganar a Rusia para no siempre decir que Rusia es malo? Pero les aviso, prepárase porque hay nuevos ejes, ejes antiguos de Francia con Marruecos y algunos países que pueden influir en las nuevas elecciones españolas, por tanto, en la debilidad de la Unión Europea, que es España, y en nuestro futuro como europeos y como libertarios. Gracias. Gracias por la pregunta. ¿Ah? Um, con respecto a, la, a lo que estamos discutiendo esta tarde, yo creo que eh, lo importante es que nuestros actores políticos y que también toda nuestra sociedad, todos los que estamos aquí, entendamos que es la legitimidad de nuestro sistema democrático lo que está en cuestión. ¿no? Y esto que obliga a todo el mundo y particularmente a aquellos que tienen eh, responsabilidades públicas a ser... Eh, Siento la redundancia, responsables eh, a la hora de actuar porque es la legitimidad del sistema lo que está en cuestión. Y esta legitimidad es, eh, que está cuestionada es una de las vulnerabilidades que están utilizando actores eh, extranjeros eh, por diferentes razones, pero que actúan con bastante hostilidad. Hoy estamos hablando mucho de Rusia, pero obviamente no es el único, pero esto contribuye a debilitar eh, la fortaleza de nuestros sistemas democráticos, que es claramente lo que está en, en cuestión. Entonces, el, el empeño ¿no? quizás mm, eh, es difícil, ¿no? pero obviamente es tratar de que todos los actores eh, el, el que participan en la vida pública, eh, tanto desde las administraciones públicas como desde la sociedad civil o desde el mundo de la empresa, entiendan que es una responsabilidad de todos proteger la legitimidad de, de nuestro sistema. Pero esto es fácil de decir, pero es difícil de ver porque hay una lucha partidista muy, muy intensa y más cuando el escenario está, está abierto. Al menos lo que tenemos que o, o, es tratar de prevenir que, digamos, actores hostiles traten de sacar un provecho manifiesto de esto, que es lo que estamos viendo. Y, bueno, este es un poco... Yeah. I will have to say it in English. I mean, yes, the, the conversation has... We've mentioned Russia quite a bit, but we've also mentioned resilience a lot because the goal here is not to, you know, just address the actors. It has actually become a more resilient society so that state and non-state actors, whether it be, you know, China, Iran, or right, far right, far left, that we are prepared for any challenge that comes our way. It's not about going the whack-a-mole way. It's about, you know, making sure that we're stronger. We have one over there and then you, I've got you. And then I still got you. It works, yeah. yeah. Good evening. Uh, today we've heard and seen that basically the producers of uh, fake news, they appeal to emotions of people. And we have to say that the outcomes of their work is pretty successful because uh, people People actually, they, they trust this information, they consider this information, because it seems that fake news, they are, uh, they are on hype. They are attractive, they are extravagant, they actually attract the attention of the recipients. And in this light, it seems to me, at least after this conversation today, that uh, reliable information and truth is just boring <laughs> for the final recipients, let's say. So my question would be, do you know or maybe we could invent some ways of um, making truth and reliable information attractive to the recipients. And maybe the techniques that producers of fake news uh, apply to their work, we could apply to the providing, disseminating uh, reliable information and news. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will take a second question if we can go, por favor, si aquí al arriba. Making truth attractive again, kind of thing. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I I, I go a little bit on the, on the line of the previous question. I mean, I think the world is getting much faster in the sense of um, massive information uh, we are having. So the attention span of the people is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. So the battlefield is changing in that sense. So I don't know. I mean, the, it seems these bots are uh, attacking our lizard brain. 
uh, or the lizard part of our brains. Uh, so th getting out the, 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 what you said before about the demand, uh, the reflection, all that. So h how are you thinking that we can fight against that? Because it seems that's going that way. <laughs> and, and seeing the younger generation, our kids, it's, it's getting even shorter term than, than longer term. Thank you. Alex, do you want to kick off? Yeah. Goodness. Um, yeah. Do you hear me? Yeah. So on on two things, I think on the on the on the first question about how to make truth reliable again, I think we have right now a problem that we ha we don't have enough news for the news consumption we have, and we are connected online twenty four seven, and you're following things, and you don't have enough things to consume. If, even if you're the, greatest, the greatest Real Madrid fan of like all the planet, you will never have enough information for you. So everything that you don't know and everything that you might know is interesting for you. So I think that th this is a strong issue that we face right now, is on, especially on big and complex issues, that we cannot have fresh news every 30 seconds just by putting out the app. So we need to understand this. So maybe we need to find also I don't know, that's a, that's a discussion open to neuroscientists, like how to open reward for sharing um, better quality news. That's something we could, we could invent. Trying, if we can't, can't get rid of the, of the reptilian brain, maybe we can use it in a better way. So I think that's maybe one <laughs> of the things. Um, the second question was about... You know, you get so much attention, your spam is very short, and so how do you actually battle against people, you know. Yeah. Um, so um, one of the things that I, I've read and I try to do sometimes, <laughs> when I'm seeing something really awful, I try not to click. <laughs> and I try to do this real painful thing is to wait 30 seconds before my screen not doing anything. I can assure you 30 seconds before your screen not doing anything is a long time. And then you try to ask yourself, okay, why do I see this? Why am I furious about this? What do I want to click? What do I want to react? How much do I know about this issue? And how much I trust my own opinion about this issue? And, that's, that's, and who can I trust on this issue? Who can I ask something? Where can I check other information? If you do this, you already have, I think, um, a, a, a built-in resilience that you can use. And that can help. And if you're doing this for every news that you find furious, I'm pretty sure there will be less retweets and less clicks for some things. And that might be the first step to apply individually. So I think there are solutions that need to be taken collectively and that we need to choose research, we need to have more journalists, more fact-checking, um, and much more initiatives. And I think society is the right place for this because that means ordinary citizens are taking a stand on this and they are developing new solutions, that, that's very good. Mm -hmm. But I think individually, we also need to understand what's going on with our brains and try to behave and try to have ethics on how we behave online. There is a, this super quote I found today, is that you don't do things in internet, you do things. It's not internet, it's not a different space, it's just the same space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead, Gareth. Uh, I have, uh, regarding your question of uh, making truth attractive, I have unwavering faith in, uh, in truth being attractive in its own right. I mean, uh, at least in the longer perspective, because uh, there is limits to how much people are willing to consume fast food with, before their bodies will start to break up. And, uh, and you, uh, I mean, you cannot make uh, or build your life upon uh, entertainment. And uh, I would say that the, still the society by and large gets this. So, uh, and uh, in particular, looking at younger people, I have uh, two nearing adult, adulthood at home. I would say that uh, they are surprisingly uh, capable of uh, distinguishing crap from the, from the legit stuff. So uh, the the challenge I uh, would say is that uh, making sure that the the skills pro to produce and consume legitimate stuff remain while the while the mass is sort of uh, running loose on uh, on entertainment or on consuming entertainment or information uh, that uh, qualifies as fast food, making sure that the, there is still uh, even in the 
in the era of attention economy that uh, the platforms where you can get reliable news and reliable information remain. And that can be seen as a, as a public function mm -hmm. uh, as well. Mm. Alex, you had a short intervention. Just, just a very short thing, we, because we talk a lot about youngsters and media literacy. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to have many friends around here tonight, but um, if, you ha if you know people that are over 60 on social media platforms, I think in terms of fake news, I think they're the worst. The, the number of emails chains, WhatsApp chains I receive from people which are between 60 and 70, 80 is full with disinformation. <laughs> and I think we should, and, the, and I'm sorry, but uh, the, the age range between 60 and 80 goes to polling station at every election. So the risk for democracy is very high. So I would encourage everyone to take media literacy class from five years old to 95 years old. There are challenges with that. Uh, David, do you want to, yeah. yeah. I, there's a really good uh, research on the reasons for disinformation um, and the spread of disinformation um, from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. It's from last year, and it's probably the best piece I've read on how bots are not that important. You, you, I'm sure you've read about it, like 90% of this information travels through psychological means. And there are two important things that journalists should take into consideration. One is novelty in the headlines, you know, something new is something that you're going to share. And of course, like it has to be new, but true, because I mean, if I say like tanks in the streets of Barcelona, then like, you know, that's a real piece that was published. It's, it's new, but it's a lie, right? And the second one is status. And I, that has to do with your question, you know, like you actually show your followers in social networks that you have a high status because you know something that they don't know, and then you share it because it makes you look good. And that has to do a lot with education and how also the social media are built. You know, like by searching, you, like, that's why Google is like better, <coughs> not perfect, but better like containing this information because there's no status there. But when you go to Facebook, but especially when you go to WhatsApp and the information that you forward, you know, that element of like showing status and like showing things that other people don't know explains a lot, you know, and explains like how this information travels that fast. And I think we should bring the big, the big platforms into this conversation because they have a responsibility, you know, and I'm very happy that Mark Zuckerberg went to testify to, <laughs> you know, the Capitol. He didn't go to the UK parliament, but he went to the European commission. But they should be involved in, in policy making, you know. Okay. I know. <laughs> now we started a little bit late, so I'll take two more questions and that's it. So I have one here and one here. And I'll take them um, one after the other, please. ¿Cómo resolvemos el conflicto? y si es deseable el establecimiento de algún tipo de líneas entre libertad de pensamiento, libertad de expresión y libertad de información y lo que sería manipulación mental y de conductas, el establecimiento de filtros o ya la censura en el último caso. Okay. Got that? Thank you. Um, I think David just spoke a bit about the question that I had. And uh, it goes to, um, would we be even here if it weren't because Facebook and Twitter had had so much success over the past six, seven years? Wonderful. Okay, so we start with libertad de expresión, so freedom of expression, yeah. the different lines. Just a, a, a brief comment on that. like. Uh, that's the Ministry of Truth, right? And of course, I'm a journalist. Freedom of speech has to be protected, but you know, like, not all speech is the same. You know, like, there are limits, you know? Like, you cannot just publish anything. I mean, you, you need to be held accountable somehow, you know? Like, if I commit perjury or 
if I, you know, uh, spread like not only disinformation but like hate uh, speech, you know, like um, I think, of course, there are limits. You know, like I, I think that's that's a fact. And uh, Twitter and Facebook, uh, I I honestly think that it's one social network or the other. It's not the content; it's the format. You know, like it's the fact that. Not, not internet was invented, but the cell phone was introduced, and we had like internet in our pocket 24/7. So, I think you could change Twitter and Facebook, but you know, there's Snapchat, there's like whatever. The, the, there would always yeah. be something, I think. Wonderful. Anyone else have anything to add on those, Ambassador Free? Do you want to close I, this out? I think that the social media companies existed for a long time in their version of a post-national paradise where they were going to usher in a new age of a completely democratic world. Well, they may have thought of themselves as creators of a new, of new utopia, but to the Russians, they look like suckers. <laughs> and they look like suckers to me. They need to be responsible for what appears on there's on, on their platforms. That does not mean content controls. It does mean transparency you know, and authenticity. And they should be made to account for what they do. The social media companies have gone from denial of the problem and ridiculing those who thought there was a problem to wanting to be seen as part of the solution. To the, I'm not sure to what degree this is sincere. I think it is mixed. But they are responding to an incentive structure which, over which we have some control. The combined leverage of the European Commission and the United States is sufficient that social media companies will respond to incentives. In other words, if we get our act together, we have the combined power to make them behave better, which in my mind means working in the integrity of service space rather than the content control space. It means exposing the front companies for RT and Sputnik. It means labeling bots as bots, labeling trolls, well, labeling fake sites that are pretending to be American or Spanish or French, as a, but are in fact Russian as such. And then there are the more complicated issues, as I said earlier, of getting into algorithmic bias, um, pushing things to our lizard brain. Okay? That's a tricky issue. But if we start breaking down the problem, we can deal with it piece by piece. And we, need, we have the ability to do so, um, combining our knowledge and experience on both sides of the Atlantic. And finally, the heroes of this are going to be the independent civil society acti activists, Alexander Ali Philippe, and like-minded groups in the United States, in Europe, the Baltic Elves, Stop Fake. Um, these groups are the ones who are going to be much, much better than old bureaucrats such as myself at uncovering and exposing disinformation operations. And then one society the, the, then the task is to get society sensitive enough so that a disinformation op is rendered anathema and people start to ch turn away from it, start to shun it. Now, easier said than done, but I will argue and have been arguing that the policy solutions do exist. It is the purveyors of disinformation or those who profit from disinformation who want to convince us that there are no solutions. Wonderful. And with that, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. A brief, a brief reminder that this is just the beginning of the conversation. We are headed to Brussels next, where we will have two full days, where we'll pick on each of every single one of these elements and expand on them. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening to us. And come talk to the speakers and get more questions. Thank you so much again. Yeah.